just to say one word to contextualize the the talk. So this is um, a segment or a piece from this project that I'm working on on Simone Weil and cinema, and it draws it tries to bring together questions of cinematic ontology and also to draw a little bit on my work in animal studies, but more so um, stuff that I've been writing about around um, this new field, subfield of vegan, vegan theory. So um, it's a bit of a mishmash of all of these things. And actually it's the first time that I'm <laughs> floating the term um, perma cinema. So it's very much a work in progress and uh, I'd be really interested to hear what people think about you know, what works and what doesn't work. Um, Cause it's, it, it really is, I'm not just, it's not just a rhetorical flourish, it really is. Um, a work in progress. Okay, so oh, one one more thing, two more things. Um, my cats, I have two cats here, and they they seem to have gone a little bit. I don't know. They've become eccentric over the last couple of evenings, and they're just kind of running amok. Um, and I can't really keep them out. So I I hope that it, they won't be too noisy. Um, if I need to, I'll have to stop and just put them out of the room. But there's a lot of kind of non-human agencies. <laughs> Uh, well, I was going to say my dogs might join in at some point as well, so it could get quite interesting. <laughs> okay, um, and also thanks, Kim. I've I've not been able to upload my my slideshow, so Kim has kindly agreed to swap slides for me. So every now and again, I'll I have to <laughs> to pause and say, please, can you switch slides? Okay, so um, I'll start. So yeah, the title is Perma Cinema. Vegetal Ethics from Lumiere to Romare. Um, and I'll actually start with um, Laura Mulvey. So nearly half a century since Laura Mulvey's visual pleasure, visual pleasure and narrative cinema exposed cinema's collusion with patriarchal ideology and a masculinist point of view, the essay is the gift that keeps on giving. The cinematic apparatus, according to Mulvey, positions men as owners of the look and the means of looking, and women as the bearers of the look. And I'm sure everyone, so this is well-trodden territory. Recast in an ecological context, Mulvey's critique of the objectification and reification of women becomes one of value extraction from the living bodies that film instrumentalizes as resources of pleasure and profit. If, as the saying goes, the cinema offers a feast for the eyes, then films vulnerable objects, women as in Mulvey, but also people of color, animals in the natural world, are not only objectified by the camera, but made edible by the apparatus, looking good enough to eat. In Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho from 1960, for example, the male viewer, voyeur, becomes the ultimate extractor consumer. He wants to devour, to possess in full the object of sight, which is why true to cinematic convention, the voyeurism of the male identified camera leads to murder. Um, can, can we switch to the second slide, please? Cinema consumes its objects with aggression and gusto in what Sartre described as, quote, the double meaning of an appropriative destruction and an alimentary enjoyment. Read through the stomach, Mulvey's male gaze is simultaneously an eye and a mouth that devours its object, yielding scopophilic and culinary pleasures. Since the very beginning, the cinema conflated the desire to see and to eat, which is rightly intuited as partly interchangeable. I think these are sort of inter interchangeable desires and cinema sh shows it. And the two images on the slide are obviously from Vertov's Man with a Movie Camera from 1929 and James Williamson's The Big Swallow, 1901, which I don't have time to talk about, but it's a great example of um, cinema as a form of devouring. Not merely ocular or even haptic, the cinema is peculiarly gastronomic, a medium that feeds on the world and thus finds itself implicated in the dynamics of extraction, consumption, and waste. In what follows, I begin to think through the cinematics of looking and as eating to consider film's fundamental dilemma brought into sharp relief in this moment of climate collapse and the sixth mass extinction. How to look without devouring, show without consuming, 
preserve while representing. As I hope to show, the cinema is not solely a ravenous machine that consumes, digests, and expunges its objects, nor is the viewer a mere receptacle of regurgitated images. Recent new materialist theory has drawn attention to matter's agentic capacities. In the area of film, new materialist work by theorists like Donna Haraway, Jane Bennett, Karen Barad, to name just three prime examples, this work has enabled a revaluation of analog film as the site of more than human encounters between the film strip, the world, and the viewer. As Kim Knowles explains, I'm going to quote you, Kim, quote, recent understandings of materialist film work with and through the potential of film's tangible properties to bring about a tactile rapprochement or interconnection between the spectator and the, phys and the physical world of matter, end quote. Photochemical film in states what Knowles calls an aesthetics of contact across human and non-human matter as a mode of resistance to senseless extractivism. In this analysis, handmade new materialist cinema offers a version, I think at least, it offers a version of perma cinema understood as a process of interaction, a becoming with worldly matter through film. My concern here today, however, isn't with film's material processes as modes of embodied engagements, and more with something like a non-extractivist ontology of film. So if I may anticipate um, in the, in the Q&A, I'd be really interested to hear how um, work on materialist film specifically might relate to the kind of stuff that I'm looking at, because the films that I'm looking at are not experimental films, and they're not primarily what you call materialist films. So um, I guess today I'm interested in how objects in film can resist the advances of the voracious observer. When objects resist, they come into view as if from a distance, as closed off and impenetrable. The gaze encounters them as what cannot be fully consumed. Instead of looking as devouring, gathering the world into our private sphere, looking can consent to the being of things as external to us, persisting beyond our grasp. I call this the look that lets be, conceding to objects their reality and sovereignty beyond human desire and will. The cinema then is, according to my understanding, a system of rampant consumption and preservation that lends itself to the analogy between looking and eating. To look like we eat means to ingest the object until it is no more. To look but not eat is to encounter the object as separate from us. The analogy between looking and eating connects culinary and visual habits and gives rise to a kind of gastro philosophy or a gastro gastrosophy of film. Can we eat without destroying? Can we look without appropriating? These questions I'm suggesting are shared by the ethics of food and the ethics of film. To respond to the ecological and ethical challenges of material and cultural sustenance, I turn to the practices of veganism and permaculture as models for the cinematic. Veganism, as everyone knows, is veganism, veganism's prohibition against consuming animal products informs my idea of the so-called non-devouring gaze, a sort of counter voyeurism that abstains from consuming and lets be the objects of, of sight. The portmanteau title of Perma Cinema draws on permaculture's insistence on cooperation rather than conflict with nature and on the protracted and thoughtful observation of the environment. And um, I mean, just to, to give you a little bit of a background very briefly on permaculture, permaculture emerged in the, in the 70s, actually came from Tasmania, from Australia, and like cinema, Permaculture is a multidisciplinary practice, so it draws on environmental science, the natural sciences, as well as on fields like architecture, design, philosophy, and it sort of brings them all together in order to design and also to implement sustainable methods of agriculture. And permaculture is guided by, they have a number of principles, but they have three sort of key guiding principles, and they are uh, summed up as care of earth, care of people, and fair share. So I think, I don't know, I think there's um, there's quite interesting 
sort of crossovers between cinema, which is also multidisciplinary and a combination between scientific and mechanical and um, sort of humanities, um, elements for the humanities and the arts. Um, yeah, there are things that sort of connect these two practices in, in interesting ways. Through the peaceable gestures of abstinence and cultivation, permaculture and the emergent field of vegan theory have much to offer, not only by way of advancing sustainable filmmaking practices, but speculatively for the elaboration of a nonviolent ontology of film. So in two examples, uh, Lumiere's Baby's Lunch from 1895, and Eric Romer's The Green Ray from 1986, questions of looking, eating, and being intersect and illuminate cinema's grappling with its own ravenous tendencies to eat up the world. Before turning to the films, however, I want to briefly touch on the analogies origin in the work of the philosopher and mystic Simone Weil, who I mentioned before. Um, so if we can have the third slide, please. The great sorrow of human life, wrote Vey, is knowing that to look and to eat are two different operations. Maybe the vices, depravities, and crimes are nearly always, or even always in their essence, attempts to eat beauty, to eat what one can only look at. Eating assimilates the other into the self and destroys it. Once the objects of the world have been thoroughly digested, they're lost to the world and paradoxically also to the observer who digested them. Lying dormant in this formulation of looking as eating is a reflection on the nature of cinema. The beautiful Freve resists assimilation by the devouring eye. She writes, quote, we want to eat all the other objects of desire. The beautiful is that which we desire without wishing to eat it. We desire that it should be. The beautiful, like food, is what she calls a carnal attraction that, unlike food, quote, keeps us at a distance and implies a renunciation. The beauty of the thing we let be makes possible a different, non-carnivorous gaze. If the devouring gaze in monks grants sadistic pleasure, the vegan gaze of perma cinema aspires to something like the loving attention. So by, by perma cinema, I'm not referring to films about or in favor of a plant-based diet or sustainable agriculture, even though I'm in favor of both. Um, veganism and permaculture, as I'm thinking of them here, signal the way, the ways in which films or moments in films call attention to the complicity between the desire to look and to eat, and in so doing, give rise to other less violent ways of being in the world. Veganism and permaculture share an orientation and an attitude towards the reality and sovereignty, the inherent value, as it's sometimes called, of others a reticence before what or whom I cannot simply use to satisfy my needs. They expresses this logic clearly in her notebooks, and she writes, to draw back before the object we're pursuing, only what is indirect is effective. We do not accomplish anything if we have not first drawn back. And I think that what I find really interesting about this statement is the way it seems to um, clash almost with the logic of new materialism because um, although I would say both they and new materialism are trying to find a way of kind of respecting and preserving matter uh, the idiom that they uses is one of withdrawal and reticence whereas the the idiom of um, new materialism is one of enmeshment and entanglement. So they seem to be, so one is moving towards matter, the other seems to be moving away from matter. And I still have to think about exactly what's going on there, where new materialist theory, which I'm really interested in as well, and they, uh, where they might meet and how, how they might interact. But again, this is something we might wanna talk about later. So film too can invoke restraint in the face of the objects of sight. As Baby's Lunch was first to show, we're uniquely instructed in this way of looking by the non-human elements in film, whose very marginality and remoteness elicits an encounter with reality, not as a resource to plunder and consume, but simply as what is. Uh, so if we can turn to Baby's Lunch slide four. 
The 30-second baby's lunch, it's actually not baby's lunch in the French, it's baby's meal, but it's, it's not, I'm using the, the translation of it as baby, baby's lunch, which is, is doing the rounds. Um, so it's a 30-second actuality, which was part of the Lumiere Brothers' historic screening in December 1895 at the Grand Café in Paris, which marked the inauguration of cinema. The film famously features Auguste and Marguerite Lumiere feeding their one-year-old baby André in the garden of their Lyon home. And as probably most of you know, the story goes that early audiences were delighted not by the culinary drama at the cent center of the frame, but by the motion of leaves in the background. So if we could um, screen the film for 30 seconds, please, thank you. Thanks. It's no coincidence, I think, that cinema's pioneering examples place the active eating center frame. Baby's lunch foregrounds an image of food consumption while occasioning a form of image consumption that avoids the devouring we see in the film. The film illustrates a basic division in cinema between looking and eating as two modes of engagement and approach that signal different extractive economies with regard to the objects of sight. In placing side by side the central image of the feeding baby and the peripheral image of the moving leaves, the film establishes the devouring gaze as the mainstay of filmic appropriation and its non-voracious alternative that attends to objects at a distance and lets them be. What was it about the leaves and the wind that so charmed viewers over and above the human drama? In a beautiful essay on Lumiere, Di Vaughan suggests that, quote, what most impressed the early audiences were, were what would now be considered the incidentals of scenes, smoke from a forge, steam from a locomotive, the rustling of leaves in the background, end quote. The beauty of the fluttering leaves made visible the operation of natural forces undirected by human hands to which the cinema is witness. Beauty, as they too implied, derives from the perception of the autonomy of natural phenomena. We experience disinterested pleasure at the sight of the leaves simply as what is, and let them be. The function of the leaves is thus strictly revelatory. They affirm the existence of the world and natural law as extrinsic, extrinsic to human intentions and are all the more beautiful for it. In another Lumiere actuality, both leaving the port from 1895 as well, nature revealed, nature is revealed through the contingent motion of the waves. So it was the leaves in the previous film and in this film it's the, the motion of the waves. The film features three men in a rowing boat making their way out to sea on choppy waters. Vaughn again writes, the swell is not heavy, but as the boat passes beyond the jetty, leaving the protection of the harbor's mouth, it is slewed around and caught broadside on by the waves. So if we could, um, again, screen this little film, it's slide number five. Thanks, and um, the next slide, please. Thank you. Vaughn continues, 
When the boat is threatened by the waves, the men must apply their efforts to controlling it. And by responding to the challenge of the spontaneous moment, they become integrated into its spontaneity. The unpredictable has not only merged, emerged from a background to occupy the greater portion of the frame, it has also taken over sway over the principles. Man has become equal with the leaves and the brick dust. Decades before Lucien Casting Taylor and Verena Paravel's sensory ethnographic extravaganza Leviathan from 2012, boat leaving the port quietly embeds humans within the material web of relations, an assemblage made of flesh, boat, water, and air. Like the leaves in the wind, the motion of waves invite, invites a non-devouring gaze that takes in reality as what assimilates us rather than assimilated by us. In a remarkable piece on cinematic meteorology, Emile Lef Melvang describes the rustling leaves of baby's lunch as testament to the, quote, consonance between weatherly and cinematic movement, end quote. Like Vaughn's incidentals of scenes, cinematic weather draws the viewers to the margins of the image. Weatherly phenomena, quote, hold a sprawling vitality, a non-narrative abundance saturated with their own inverse forms of significance. The weatherly cine phenomenon is an end unto itself. Cinematic weather can never be fully instrumentalized in narrative, end quote. The presence of weather in Baby's Lunch is non-narrative, that's true, but its enthusiastic reception by viewers tells a story about cinematic ecology and human ontology. The wind acts as a powerful leveler between humans and everything else. And this impression was really sharpened for me when I rewatched this film over and over again in lockdown, knowing that its star baby Andre died of flu in the 19... 18 pandemic, aged just 24. The pandemic is present in Baby's Lunch in the form of a future contingent. The moving leaves and the airborne virus belong to different orders of the image. The former, the moving leaves, is present, albeit indirectly, as wind itself is invisible, while the latter is knowable only in hindsight and impossible to capture by the cinematograph. But in another sense, Meteorological and biological processes belong to the single order of contingency that sweeps over leaves and people alike. The wind in the film, in other words, is both the benign mover of vegetation and the carrier of deadly disease. Delight at the sight of the leaves in the wind arises out of the perception of what is impersonal about human experience, that we can that we can and we are moved by the same forces that cause leaves to flutter. Baby's Lunch determines what they described as, quote, the point of equilibrium between man and nature. If the film seems to split the visual field into human foreground and non-human background, the cinematics of weather thrusts Baby's Lunch in the opposite direction, breaching the species divide and embedding humans in the mesh of earthly materials. So I'd like to now turn to The Green Ray, which I take to be a little cheekily, but I take it to be a remake of, of Baby's Lunch. So if we can have the seventh slide, please. So I'm gonna try and convince you that <laughs> The Green Ray is indeed a remake of um, the Lumiere film. Leaves in the Wind recur in Eric Romero's The Green Ray, which adds a second meteorological element the optical phenomenon of the green ray, the last ray at sunset, visible only under strict atmospheric conditions. Due to its rarity, seeing the green ray is construed in the film and, and generally is construed as a moment of radical transparency during which one can truly know their own feelings and those of others. In another nod to Lumiere, the green ray contains not one, but a series of alfresco meals through which it explores the relationship between humans and the natural world and between looking, eating, and being. The Green Ray's plot is minimalist. Delphine, a single Parisian office worker, tries in vain to go on her summer holidays. So it's August and everyone has left Paris and Delphine um, is caught up in the situation where all her plans seem to fall through. 
She goes back and forth from Paris and back, unable to connect with people around her. Seeking love rather than just casual sex, she rejects the advice of her increasingly irritated friends to just lighten up and go with the flow. The film proceeds as a series of disappointments until the final segment, when Delphine's chance encounter with a young man leads her to a rare sighting of the Green Ray. Unlike Melvang's formal conception of cinematic meteorology, which I quoted just a little bit earlier, in Romare, the Green Ray's function is narrative. It appears as the culmination of Delphine's quest, and even in a slightly kind of um, kitschy way, it can be seen as the film's happy ending. So by the end of the film, she's, she's rewarded, as it were, by seeing the Green Ray. Although here, meteorology does not occupy the margins of film to establish, quote, an ontology not made up of narrative or interpretive cues, but entirely of sensation, immersion, and movement, this is Melvin again, Romare's relation to Lumiere is deeply ecological. Not only does Romare repeatedly show leaves in the wind, he makes questions about the ethics of eating the film's main contention. So I think that the Green Ray is really, I mean, it's about a lot of things, um, but one of the main things that it's about is precisely how to be in the world without consuming it and how to be able and ready to receive something back from the world, something like the sighting of the Green Ray. In a key scene prefaced by a shot of leaves in the wind, Delphine struggles to defend her vegetarianism. So she's having, this is one of the many meals, outdoor meals, and she's sitting with her hosts and everyone is eating meat and she, uh, it turns out, we find out that she's vegetarian and then this whole debate ensues about why she's vegetarian and she can't quite uh, make a very strong case for herself. The sequence crystallizes the film's preoccupation with the themes of eating and specifically of eating as a kind of violent appropriation. So I have... Um, a clip of that particular sequence, and it's a little bit, it's a little bit long. It's about five to six minutes long, but I think it's worth looking at. Um, and I hope it won't be. We checked before; it didn't seem to lag too much. So um, I'd like to play that slide eight. Thanks. Um, can we please move on to the next slide? Thanks. So eating plants, Delphine says, feels lighter, a convivial, less violent incorporation. Her remarks that lettuce is a friend baffles and provokes her hosts. Delphine is not helped by her faltering, incomplete speech. Unsurprisingly, a whole host of, I have to say, male commentators find Delphine unconvincing. Leo Bersani, for example, calls her explanations pathetic, and Rob White, in film comment, I think, describes her defense as, quote, shambolic and contradictory. But what looks like a flaw in Delphine's debating abilities discloses a general aporia about eating, which, as Michael Martyr puts it, is, quote, inherent, is inherently unethical, a violent destruction of the immediate autonomy of the eaten incorporated into the eater, end quote. The Green Ray asks what it might mean to eat and to live without devouring the objects of sustenance. Um, slide 10, please. When one of Delphine's companions exclaims in frustration, you're a plant, the film takes on an even more radical turn. From eating plants, it embraces a vegetal ethics of eating and being like a plant. What could eating and looking like a plant possibly mean? Unlike human animals, most plants nourish themselves nonviolently through the passing, passive capturing of light and the drawing of nutrients from the soil. Plant eating, argues Martyr, is hospitable rather than predatory. Quote, not tantamount to interiorization, but to a sort of receptivity, a channeling of the other and an orientation to the outside. So basically plants um, kind of process light and but what they use to eat just passes through them without 
be, being destroyed, except for carnivorous plants. But as I said, most plants, but most plants nourish themselves in that sort of um, nonviolent way. If eating and being more like plant, if, if eating and being more like plants were possible, it would entail exchanging predation for openness, grasping for waiting. Instead of pursuing, we would wait for the world to show itself to us. And this again returns to Vey's notion of pursuing without pers some, something, some kind of pursuit through retreat. So you pursue the object by moving away from it. Um, and can we please have slide 11? Thanks. What if, asks Martyr, again, this is him, what if rather than shedding light onto our objects, and assigning definite purposes to them, we exposed ourselves to light." End quote. Such reverse exposure aptly describes the disinterested pleasure we take in Lumiere's moving leaves, a gaze that does, not, that does nothing more than acknowledge the presence of the world. It doesn't really uh, integrate the leaves into a story, into a narrative. It also doesn't really um, necessarily sort of project any kind of meaning onto them. The leaves are perceived as simply that thing that is out there. But Martyr's notion of reverse exposure applies even more readily to Delphine, who exactly like a plant, turns to light as a source of nourishment and growth, the green ray. Slide 12. The green ray itself is an exercise in filming like a plant. As Jeff Andrew explains, he writes about Romare that unlike most filmmakers, Romare never subscribed to filmmaking as an industrial endeavor. He tended to work very inexpensively with a tiny crew and cast, shooting on location, often on 16 mil. And it's indeed the green ray was also shot on 16 millimeter. The green ray's documentary feel is partly the result of its collaborative improvisational method. It was co-authored with lead actress Marie Riviere and improvised on camera, allowing the film to kind of grow organically. And partly that growth is partly to do with contingency, with chance and with the relationship between the actors and what spontaneously arose during the filming. The vegetal also informs Romare's light touch approach to production. He used a minimal three-person crew. Interestingly, the, the crew were three three women. Because because there's, I haven't really mentioned it, but there's obviously some kind of a gender, you can graph gender onto um, ideas of devouring and aggression. As a remake of Baby's Lunch, the Green Ray doesn't simply restage cinemeteorology and outdoor dining. Romare integrates the two modalities of the earlier film, the devouring at the foreground and the cinematics of letting be in the periphery, and makes them into the subject of his film. The green ray in its totality is about reverse exposure and waiting, the protagonist's comedic becoming plant literally rewarded by light at the end of the film. And I should, um, I should add that there's a, there's a whole other dimension to this that I'm not really going into, and that's uh, the religious dimension, because Romare's, um, although there's, there's nothing theistic about the film in the film, but I think um, it's a well-known fact that Romare was a devout Catholic, and for him, the material world is some kind of a, a bridge to a transcendent reality. So the Green Ray does, can be understood in that sort of more transcendental context, but it's not a context that, um, that rejects materiality and matter it rather it looks at matter as a kind of mediator to to another to another realm to a transcendental realm so we can have the final the final slide which is the end the happy ending of the film the film literally ends with the word we as in yes um when the the green ray reveals itself so my, my closing remarks really are, are these. As perma cinema, Lumiere and Romare illustrate cinema's peculiar position in the age of the Anthropocene. Both films, I argue, trace cinema, cinema's two contrasting impulses, 
to consume the world without compunction, seeking to dominate and devour, and to tentatively, tentatively look beyond and without devouring, nurturing the onlooker through a plant-like modality of passive capture. How we eat, writes Michael Martyr, is a physical reflection of how we think, an embodied laboratory of our relation to the outside world in all its materiality, end quote. Cinema, too, is an embodied laboratory in which, perhaps, we can make peace with matter. <laughs>